Andy. Hey, Ray, how are you doing? Great. So yeah. welcome to the show. It's Thanks. been a few months since we've had you on. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we talked about something, a grand plan for fiscal sustainability, I, I recall, something you called a blueprint. And it's referred to now as the Salinas Plan. Is that correct? Right. Back then, it, we called it the National Resource Network Plan. But mm -hmm. since then, um, we've rebranded. It, it's, been, it's being referred to as its title, which is the right. Salinas Plan. Great. So it's a 10-year plan. You described that before. Can you tell us, uh, you know, what ha has happened since the introduction of the plan? How was it received by the city council, the public, uh, the employees? Sure. So um, we presented the plan back on uh, December 4th. And since then, uh, one of the main things that's happened is the, so the council did its strategic planning session and talked about a lot of their goals and priorities for the next three years. And this plan was brought up as part of that as, you know, something that we need to be incorporating into what we're doing moving forward. Uh, we've had three meetings with the uh, employees at, you know, different times to help them understand what the plan says. We've put it online so that people can read it. Um, we've reached out to members of the media and done press releases to let people see what's happening. And uh, the other big thing that we're doing is we're starting to put together uh, an implementation tracking program so that we can actually keep track of what we're doing and report back to the council and the public what's happening. Because one of the concerns we often hear when we do a new study is, you know, that people don't want, just want something that's going to sit on the shelf. So right. we want to make sure that this isn't just, okay, that was a great idea, let's put it on the bookshelf and forget about it. We need to actually do what it says, or at the very least, investigate everything that it recommends. Right. So let's just go back. The plan, uh, main uh, reason for being is to accomplish uh, a sustainable financial uh, plan for the city over the next 10 years. Right. And to avoid what? Well, in a worst case scenario, yeah. I mean, no one likes to use the term bankruptcy, but yeah. that's your worst case scenario. If you have, don't have enough money to pay your bills, then that's right. what you have to do. Um, the plan analysis essentially shows us running out of reserves by fiscal year 23, that's 22, 23. And then um, at that point, we would be bringing in less money than we're, we're making and we'd have no money to cover the deficit. And so if we're not making reductions by then, then the reductions are just going to start happening when we can't afford to pay our bills. Right. So the drivers for why we can't have enough uh, money to meet the expenses over the time, uh, can you describe- Employee your benefits. Okay. And it's not even employee wages, right. which have been relatively level. It's the pension costs, cost of health care, mm -hmm. workers' compensation, but especially pensions. Right. And a big reason for that is the CalPERS changed the discount rate, mm -hmm. um, which essentially the, we're looking at about a $60 million cumulative deficit over the next 10 years. And pretty much all of that can be attributed to that change and the fact that we now need to fund pensions um, that were not being funded in the past. If it was not for that, we would have an, a very uh, narrow, but we would still have a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. So those costs, uh, the way uh, those obligations are calculated, are up to the state and controlled by the state. We have no control over that. Right. So under this contractual obligation that we have as a city, to make sure that we honor that obligation annually and into the future, they they set a prescribed amount based on um, whatever uh, you know projections, based on actuarials and other kinds of things they're looking at in the future, right? Right. CalPERS gets their funding from three different sources. That's their investment returns, cities, and employees. So. They can't increase the amount the employees contribute. So whenever their investment returns don't cover the gap, cities are responsible to fill that gap. And that's the situation we find ourselves in today. Um, in order to buy our way out of the contract, it would cost more than $100 million, mm -hmm. which the city doesn't have that. So 
we are looking at you know staying the uh, keeping the path straight on pension right. funding. So you said their cost of benefits totally. Uh, the city has about 80% of what the service providers uh, are made up of uh, employee costs. And so it's a very uh, employee driven situation because we're, the city is a we're service, service industry. industry. Yeah. Right. So um, <clears throat> how much of the report is represented with ad addressing these benefit issues? A big chunk of the report looks at this, um, although only a small portion of the recommendation section actually looks at that. And mm -hmm. there are um, three recommendations that directly affect employee compensation, um, one of which is revenue neutral. Uh, so it's really two recommendations, and one of them calls for the employees to gradually increase the percentage of the health care costs that they're paying, that they pay for, and the other is to eliminate a certain type of leave. And those are both two very large, significant items when it comes to balancing the budget. Taken together, they represent about 60% of the total recommendations, yet at the same time, they only represent two out of 32 recommendations total. So there's a lot of different ideas that were looked at, a lot of different ways of resolving this. And while these are significant items, they're not the only items. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like you mentioned, employee costs represent about 80% of the total costs to the city. So this is actually, you know, a, a way of preserving employee benefits because mm -hmm. you're only looking at it, taking 60% of the reductions from employees when they're 80% of the costs. Right. So the premise is the, the plan is try to keep intact those vital services, core services, basic services to the public. R right. right. You don't want to do layoffs right. because layoffs mean less services. Right. If, you, if you lay off a police officer, that's right. one less police officer out there. So you, you, you really don't want to do that. And that was one of the main points they made right. is that you, we want to make sure that we're preserving these employee positions. Right. So let's take leave. You mentioned a couple of different I, uh, ways leave is, is provided to as a benefit to the city. So it, in terms of what the consultant may have described, how does our leave policy look compared to other cities, counties, public agencies? So our leave policies are, compared to other jurisdictions, extraordinarily generous. Mm -hmm. um, we get paid time off, it's called annual leave, which mm -hmm. is essentially a combination of our uh, vacation and sick leave. Um, and that is slightly above overall norms. It's certainly better than what the private sector gets, but it's relatively consistent with what other, other government agencies are doing. Mm -hmm. We also get floating holidays, um, two floating holidays per year, in addition to our regular holidays. Um, and that's uh, not unique, mm -hmm. it, but it's not super common. And then we have a third type of leave, which is either called management leave or flexible leave. And that is not standard. Um, management leave is sometimes found for exempt employees and it will usually range in the 20 to 40 hours per year range. Mm -hmm. Whereas the city of Salinas provides 130 hours of management leave. Flexible leave, we couldn't find any other examples of that existing in any other jurisdiction. Right. Um, and in both cases, those leaves can be exchanged for cash uh, if it's not used every year. And in fact, that's exactly what happens because if you don't exchange it for cash by the end of the year, then you lose the leave. Ah. Um, and mm -hmm. you can uh, use it as leave but then what tends to happen is if you use the flex leave or the management leave as your leave, your annual leave totals start going up. And once that passes 600 hours, it gets cashed out as well. Mm -hmm. So it's actually very difficult for employees to not cash out their leave and use all of it. I myself, uh, if I were to take all the time off I had coming to me, I would take 55 days off a year. That's almost three months. Wow. And I, my, I don't think my boss will let me do that. No, I don't <laughs> think your boss <laughs> would either. <laughs> uh, so that's a real dilemma. On one hand, there's a leave policy to help, uh, you know, 
uh, where employees, you know, manage their uh, personal life actually, yeah. and get away from that, you know, maybe in some cases a very stressful situation in terms of the workplace and the demands, and takes actually take time off. So uh, it sounds like we're taking less time off, but cashing out more in terms of uh, the benefit of leave overall. Right. There's. It's just not possible for the employees to take all of their time off. Right. Uh, it's just you can't do it. It's right. almost mathematically impossible. So it and it is essentially a cash benefit. And this is a painful recommendation. I mean, yeah. employees, you know, have been getting this for years. They're accustomed to it. Um, it is a sacrifice. But when you're looking at the alternatives here, mm -hmm. that when there's not enough money, something's got to give someplace. Right. And when you're looking at benefits like this, that while I certainly like the benefit, um, I think it's a, a, a it's been great to b get these large checks every year, but I can't justify telling other people that they're going to need to lose their jobs so that and the community will get less services so that I can keep getting this check every year. It's not a benefit that's common. It's not something that we need mm -hmm. in order to recruit qualified employees. Mm -hmm. So in the, on balance, mm -hmm. uh, in, in my perspective, I happen to agree with this recommendation that given the options, this is probably the best one. Right. So take less leave, less cash outs. Less cash outs is what it comes and, up to. And um, actually still be competitive on the leave policy so in terms of recruiting and re retention of employees. Uh, but the money saved would help uh, with the sustainability of the financial picture over the next 10 years. Exactly. Okay. So that we can keep operating, right. keep providing services, and not have to worry about what positions are we going to have to eliminate next right. year. I think it's so important the public understands that the, the blueprint, this sustainability plan, the Salinas plan, really is important and in their interest of uh, in, in, ter in terms of trying to make sure those core services are continually provided them. These are the, I think, services, right, they expect. Right, and, and budgets are not naturally interesting. Spreadsheets aren't something <laughs> that, you know, people go look at at their spare time. Right. But if the budget's out of whack, then nothing else will work. It's mm -hmm. just like having a good engine in a car. and. Yeah. If that doesn't work, it doesn't matter how nice the rest of the car is. Right. So I think it's something that the public really needs to be paying attention to because if this isn't managed properly, everything else is going to start just a little bit at a time, just starts mm -hmm. falling apart because mm -hmm. you can't run a city without money. Right. So that represents a significant or, you know, a, a good portion of the overall plan. Mm -hmm. 60% is devoted to um, our workforce costs. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit more about some of the other areas. And, and, and you can even mention, I guess, one of the sections is uh, not totally in our control, but housing is another area they made recommendations. Not a direct operation of the city, but something we, um, we are involved in and in just about every city has an acute housing issue in the state. So maybe we can start with the other recommendations. What are some of the other uh, kinds of classifications of uh, recommendations uh, other than the workforce? So some of them come down to, um, I'll, I'll call them um, management items in terms of things like implementing priority-based budgeting, doing long-term budget forecasts when making major decisions and looking at what are the long-term implications of, of this instead of just living in the current budget year. And those are policies that have been enacted by council um, either before or since the report was published and really are sort of common sense items that, you know, well, we all we should have been doing this all along, but mm -hmm. okay. Um, there's other items that are along the lines of government efficiency, finding are we really providing the services in the best way? Um, and there's, you know, some items looking at how we uh, structure our public works and library community services departments. Uh, how do we uh, provide um, records keeping services in the police department. Num another number of places where we're looking at efficiencies. 
Um, and then there's areas such as uh, how are we subsidizing other services with the general fund? So council recently adopted some revisions to its uh, parking program downtown. And the general fund has been putting about $300,000 a year or more into that parking fund because it's been operating at a deficit. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of a uh, program that we've made changes to hopefully get that number reduced or eliminated. Uh, also looking at partnerships that we have, um, such as n uh, North Monterey County Fire District. The Salinas Fire Department covers a certain uh, portion of their district and looking at what they pay us and whether or not that's actually covering our costs, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a fair price. Um, and then, like you mentioned on housing, uh, a number of recommendations that are looking at uh, how are we going to provide more housing? How are we going to get housing targeted towards those groups that have the most need? And uh, how are we going to fund these issues? So there's recommendations regarding housing trust funds. Mm -hmm. Also looking at um, uh, within neighborhoods, rental registry programs, as well as uh, tenants' uh, rights issues, whether boarding houses could be allowed or not allowed in certain residential districts. A lot of things to, to be looking at, mm -hmm. um, but the intent that we need to make sure that housing is affordable. Housing is a, ne is a necessity of life. Mm -hmm. uh, you, it's not, you can't just not buy housing very easily right. and not seriously impact your quality of living. Right. So that's why we're taking a very keen interest in the report makes uh, strong recommendations that we need to make sure that we're enacting policies to try to alleviate the negative impacts of the high housing prices right. that we're seeing right now. And it looks like one of the huge impacts is to those core services. Mm -hmm. The demand is higher when the uh, uh, housing shortage is uh, that exists, uh, demand more attention because of crowding or overcrowding conditions, more intense, uh, uh, you know, spaces being used up by uh, a lot of residents in different ways mm -hmm. requiring uh, additional service calls. Right. And whenever you're dealing with issues of overcrowding also, you've got more cars on the street and mm -hmm. people are concerned about cars being parked in front yards sometimes. Right. And our code enforcement people get complaints sometimes. And mm -hmm. um, just when you have more people in a small space, it leads to more conflicts. Yeah. So. Let's go back to the 60% involving workforce uh, impl uh, costs. Um, what's the reaction by our bargaining units to the report so far? Pretty similar to my initial reaction, which is they don't like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, this well. is something that employees have fought for in the past and mm -hmm. won, and they feel that it's uh, part of their compensation. Sure. Um, I think that they don't believe that the uh, city should be balancing its budget on you know, the backs of employees, mm -hmm. that um, other entities should be doing their fair share. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's sort of the initial reaction. At the same time, um, I think that there is a recognition that what is going on right now is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't heard anyone say there isn't a problem so um, if we can all agree that there's a problem, then I'm hoping we can all agree that there needs to be a solution. And if this is not the solution, then what is? Um, there's a lot of other items in here. Mm -hmm. We really looked under a lot of stones mm -hmm. when this report was being done. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of other recommendations in here that are controversial. So I don't think anyone can accuse um, uh, the, the city administration of the authors of this report of uh, not making mm -hmm. the tough calls because right. there are other tough decisions in here. But I think that there's still some more work that needs to be done in terms of um, convincing people that this is in fact the best solution available. Yeah. Well, it seems uh, that some of those recommendations concerning the workforce would be subject to a good faith bargaining. Yes, all of them. And mm -hmm. it doesn't, these were structured in a way to make sure that we could achieve the savings while still 
having a competitive compensation package right. when you're trying to recruit employees. But that doesn't mean that this is the only way to accomplish mm -hmm. that goal. So the bargaining units, of course, you know, we can have that conversation about what is the best way to structure this. It doesn't necessarily have to be this. Mm -hmm. It's really the, the level of impact that's what's really important and ensuring that we're providing services because that is our foremost mission as a city government. We have to provide services. Mm -hmm. And we also need to make sure that in order to do that, we need to be able to be competitive in recruiting employees. Right. So um, as uh, it's being structured for implementation, how is that approach? Uh, can you give the, all of us a, a little more information about uh, how, you're, how you're actually going to be tracking it, where some of the recommendations may end up? Uh, are you going after easier items first uh, rather than later? Those kinds of sort of factors in terms of how a plan like this, a very complex plan, uh, is executed and actually implemented over time. Okay. So I'll start off with um, reporting. Right. So we're going to provide monthly reports to the, so the Council's Finance Subcommittee and that's going to really be more topical, most likely. And then we're going to be providing quarterly reports to the full council, and that will be more global and providing full updates as to a lot of as where a lot of different items are. As far as how we decide the order, it's going to depend mostly on um, a number of factors. Some things that are really easy can go quickly, of course. Mm -hmm. But the report identifies savings um, in certain fiscal years. Some items it assumes can start quickly, some it assumes are going to take a while. So of the 32 recommendations, there are nine of them that have a specific dollar value saving um, estimated for the fiscal year that's coming up starting in July. So we are currently looking at those nine because the budget documents, even though the fiscal year doesn't start till July, the budget documents need to go to council by you know, May, really, right. which means they need to be prepared in April or March, and mm -hmm. it's now March. Right. So that means that we need to figure this out ASAP. So uh, let's look at the um, total cost in terms of a projected number for the upcoming budget, for example. Is there a number or a range of dollars you're looking for on the saving side? So if we were to implement all nine recommendations and all of them achieve the impact that's in the report, it would be about $750,000 in savings. Okay. Which unfortunately is still not enough to get the, the budget balanced, although it would be balanced the next year. Um, that, uh, that 750 actually includes um, a $500,000 expenditure mm -hmm. to create what's called a productivity bank. So, and that is a program that's designed to find efficiencies by enabling employees to look for ways to identify ways to save money if upfront costs could be provided. So if they see, hey, if we had $100,000 and if we get this $100,000, we can save $50,000 a year, then they can submit that idea and try to get that idea funded. Mm -hmm. And that's a way to get that sort of thing done outside of the regular budget process, right. which is more focused on operations generally. Is there a savings number for that? or There's no savings number. It's just so. listed as a cost. Right. There, wouldn't be a cost in theory because it's it's a bank it's a loan program mm -hmm. so if you do get savings then the bank gets paid back and w if you decide someday that we don't want it anymore then you just take the money and it should all still be there in theory mm -hmm. and you can just put it right back where it was so it's really more of a five hundred thousand dollar loan but that's not how accounting works what are some of the public comments specifically that have been made about any any parts of the plan that you've had, um, you know, that, that you've been presented with questions or comments or concerns about, you know, how the what the plan recommends or doesn't? So what I'll <coughs> say is that 
I don't think I've met anyone who likes everything in this plan, but everyone has something different they don't like. Mm -hmm. The bargaining units have parts they don't like, which are completely different from the concerns I heard from, say, the Chamber of Commerce. Right. Um, there is a lot of questions as to why doesn't so-and-so do more? And the fact of the matter is that so-and-so probably is being asked to do something mm -hmm. as well. But what I am hearing is that, that, that understanding that we do need to do something. And wherever you think that money should be coming from, we do need to balance the budget. And I think there's a recognition that if everybody were to, if we were to do this and everybody steps up and does their part, then we can get there. Mm -hmm. We also have the option of just, ha if er everyone can just fight and try to get more for themselves at the expense of somebody else, but this is a zero sum game. If somebody gets savings, it's gonna come out of someone somewhere else. Right. There's no way to just do half and then everything else can just stay the same. So I think there's some recognition of that. And other than that, we're just gonna have to see um, what people want to do. And I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of history, right? a uh, lot, lot of background here as to, you know, what's happened before. Mm -hmm. And that's not something to be ignored, mm -hmm. but we have to all focus, I think, on what are we going to do now that we're in this situation. Right. It sounds like a, uh, a lot of work and also a lot of uh, maybe making a pitch for certain recommendations. In your research or knowledge of other cities and other places in either California or the country, is anybody else doing a 10-year plan? Did Not you know? to the scale that we've done ours. So mm -hmm. when the National Resource Network did our report, they also did four other cities um, in the Midwest and back east. Um, but they were more focused on singular items. One of them, I believe, looked at pensions. Mm -hmm. I think two of them looked at economic development. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of them did this comprehensive study of operations because we, we weren't looking at this in terms of a single issue. We were just looking at it as what do we need to do so that we're living within our means and managing the funds that we have. The, the residents of Salinas have been very generous for the past several years. We've got uh, Measure E, we've got Measure G, we've got, uh, we've got that funding from them. They we did the revision to the utility users tax. Mm -hmm. So now it's up to us to find a way to use the money that we've been provided right. and provide a sustainable long-term model. Right. Well, it's been a pleasure to always uh, yeah. to have you on the show with such a, at least I find a very interesting topic is how to keep uh, the city solvent and still provide those basic services our citizens demand, which is so important. That's our mission. Right, that's the right. point. So hopefully in the next few months, uh, as you're further along in the plan and maybe after the budget's passed, we can get another update from you. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure, Andy. Thank you for being on the show. My pleasure, thank you for having me.